Good morning, everyone. Welcome to worship this morning. We still got people joining us in the sanctuary as they make their way in, so I invite you to come on in and find your seats. And uh, we know people are still coming online and connecting with us virtually, and so we will see you when you join us. And we're thankful we can continue to gather in person and online. I'm also valuing the fact that as we head into the summer, uh, we're seeing more people take in our church services sometime during the week when they weren't available on a Sunday morning because they're away or at the lake. Uh, they're still wanting to connect as a church, and so I'm thankful we have that opportunity as well. So for those watching during the week or down the road a bit, we're so thankful you can join us for worship this morning or evening or whenever it is for you. Last week, we kicked off our sermon notes for kids. Uh, with a bit of a challenge. If your, kid, if your child completes the notes for each Sunday that month and shows them to myself or Kristen or texts us a picture of them, we're going to invite them to an ice cream party with a parent at my house or Kristen's house. We're going to have three of them this summer. We'd love to hang out with you. Now, if you're missing a Sunday, talk to us if it doesn't work out or with our online recording, your kids can always catch up midweek if you miss it. Uh, you can download the notes at pcom.ca slash notes. It's on the screen behind me. And as we come into worship, I just want to read from Psalm 36 this morning. Shout for joy to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name and make his praise glorious. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies cringe before you. All the earth bows down to you. They sing praise to you. They sing the praises of your name. Let's turn to God in prayer. Holy God, we come this morning shouting for joy to you. Not because our lives are perfect or there's no struggles or challenges in life. We shout for joy because in the midst of the mess of life, we can call out to you knowing you will hear us, knowing you love us, knowing that you are at work in the midst of all the brokenness of this world. And so, God, we gather this morning to sing praise to your name, for your deeds are awesome. And as we enter into worship this morning, God, we celebrate your presence now here in our midst, and we celebrate the fullness of your kingdom that is to come. In your name we pray, amen. Let's stand and worship the risen King. Couldn't fill me 
Good morning. There we go. Hello and welcome. It is so glad to have you joining us online and for the many of you who are here in person. It's just so nice to see you and we love hearing the noises of the kids and the families who are back. It is truly wonderful. So this is the community life piece and normally we have a lot to say about what's going on, but as we know, summer is near, but that doesn't mean that God isn't working and stuff isn't happening. So if you have stuff in your life that God has been doing and you wanna share it with us, send a text, the number was, or will be on the screen later. Let us know, we wanna celebrate you, pray with you, rejoice, whatever that looks like. So today, boys and girls, I don't have an object lesson for you, unfortunately, but I do wanna tell you about everything that is going on in the ministries for you, or Rooted Kids for you this summer. So the first thing we have going on is our Summer in the Psalms Memorization Challenge game. So that has started, but it doesn't matter. You have all the way until August 27th to complete the 11 weeks of verse memorization. So if you wanna cram it all into one month, go for it. If you wanna take it week by week, send me an email at kristen at parliamentchurch.com. And how that works is simply, I send you an email with the memory verses, you send me a video back, and you get points, and the points equal prizes. We have four different levels, and they are fun family prizes. The second thing that's happening actually starts on Monday of next week, so not tomorrow, but the week after, and that is our Safari VBS for our preschoolers. If you have someone in your family, or in your neighborhood, or maybe your friends that is ages three and four, they are welcome to join us starting Monday, next week, the 20th to the 24th. Cost is $10 a child, and we are keeping within COVID regulations, so there is limited uh, spots available, but you can register at pcom.ca slash VBS, and I'll put all of that in the link when I get to uh, my seat. Finally, uh, well, we'll actually have popovers and VBS in a box for the summer, those haven't been released yet, hopefully in the next week or two. Finally, we will be doing a multi-sports camp for kids ages, uh, ages 6 to 11, uh, August 16th to 21st, sorry, moment there. And that is what it sounds like. We're going to be looking at the skills that you use in the sports and then exploring different sports. So if that interests you, uh, you can register at aia.sh slash pc. C C A M P S. And all of that can be found on our website or on our Facebook page or in the e-news. So that's what's happening in Rooted Kids Ministry. We're excited to see you back and connect with you families and uh, have a great week. Good morning. I will be reading this morning from Psalm 146. If you want to take time to look that up and you can follow along with me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, in mortal men who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in it. The Lord who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free. The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the foreigner 
and sustains the fatherless and the widow, but he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, unto all generations. Praise the Lord. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus replied, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, he told him. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was, but others said, no, he only looks like him. But the man himself insisted, I am the man. Well, how then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud put it on my eyes. He told me to go Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? I don't know, he said. They brought him to the Pharisees, this man who had been blind. Now the day in which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also knew how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes and I washed it and now I see. But some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. And they asked them, is this your son? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it then that he could see? Well, we know that he is our son and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah, would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time, they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner, they said. But he replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? I have told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They hurled insults at him and said, you are the fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, who had been blind. Now that is remarkable. 
You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? They threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him, the man asked. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you now. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into the world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. May God add his blessing to the reading of this word from John 9. Thus begins the headset dance of taking off the mask and getting it back on. Mm -hmm. uh, Ta-da! Yeah, you're good. I'm try and get this close. Is that about right, Bob? Nice. It's funny with that passage, no matter how many dozens or maybe even hundreds of times I read it, I laugh at the back and forth, kind of the cheeky back and forth between these folks. And it would be a hilarious passage if not for the fact that it's all about judging spiritual arrogance for the condemnation of God. And then that hits a little bit heavier than the funny parts. But uh, hey, howdy, y'all. Let's have some fun. So let's take a minute, pray together, and then we'll dive into this passage. Father, you are good and gracious. Your love sees us through all things. That as finite as we may be, you come to us and relate to us on our level out of depths of love and forgiveness and grace that in many ways we can't even comprehend fully. But we thank you. Jesus, we thank you for coming and showing yourself to us so that we could know who you are. That we could understand a little bit more of your character and who you've created us with the potential to be through that. And we pray, Spirit, that you would give us wisdom as we read through this passage this morning, as we think through it, as we wrestle with the implications for ourselves about who how would you see us and how we see you. We pray your blessing upon our time and that you would lead and guide us through it well to be more your people well and to love the world that you have created. We love you and trust this time to you. Amen. So in all my years of living, I've never been accused of being an artistic person. Autistic maybe, but not artistic. Not particularly good with the whole drawing and painting thing that some people that I know are so very, very good at. I can remember one piece of artwork that I did in grade seven. It was this thing where I had a picture of Yogi Berra, uh, and I was old for Yogi Berra, but we got a picture out of a magazine, and then we were supposed to draw a grid on it and then transcribe it to another piece of paper, right? I felt pretty good about that one. It came out pretty well. 
But the reality is, any time that you're drawing using a paper grid, it's probably nothing to be too proud of, right? So I never had the steady hand or the fine motor skills or anything to be able to draw well on my own. But over this past year and a bit of our Rona 2020, art skills have taken over my household as Warhammer 40K game models, these kind of things, have becoming the all-consuming interest of my kids and in part me too. It's kind of part hobby, part board game, and a little bit of everything involved there. So where once there was this pretty white shelf holding pretty things in our pretty living room, there's now an art shelf that's stocked with every color under the rainbow and paints from everywhere so that the boys can paint their models. And where once there was space to walk between the living room and dining room, there's now my grandma's old dining room table for the board game that gets used for countless hours of battles between my children every week. And where once there were boys that only played video games and built Lego, there are now three accomplished model builders and painters of capable of great things of creativity and detail. So I'd like to introduce you this morning, from left to right, to Abaddon the Despoiler, Ragnar Blackmane, and Raboot Gilliman. Yeah, fancy names, right? But my boys have put sometimes 20, 30 hours or more into building one of these models that's kind of one to three inches tall, painting them, and shown skill in doing it that I could never have imagined or thought of doing myself. So I have an army of my own as well, one built of fierce warrior nuns that are undefeated to this point in our family. However, I've only had time to actually try and paint one of them myself. This little Technicolor battle sister isn't terrible, but it clearly lacks the precision and shading and artfulness of my boy's creations over the past year and a bit. But thankfully, though, it's still much better than some of the stuff they used to create earlier on in life. Like that. <laughs> like, what is that? Right? Apparently, this was our family. And it seems that we are smoking in a car while being chased by trolls towards a volcano. <laughs> and I thought, is that it? Is that how my children see our family? Some farcical fantasy family bent on a fiery demise. And that's all that we have to look forward to. This is the meaning of family for them. But when an artist creates something, they obviously do so with some intent behind what they've put together, right? But once it's out there, the expression of it tends to be more about the person who's seeing it. Their interpretations of it say as much about them as it does about us. So, with that in mind, how does our vision of God affect what we see? About what we see of God or of faith? or even of life in general. In the story of this miraculous restoration that we're looking at this morning, of this man's sight by Jesus, it's interesting to see how Jesus challenges the Pharisees' conceptions of God. Our understandings of God color our perceptions of life. It's written in John chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, that as he went along, that's Jesus, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The disciples grew up in a culture and a way of understanding God that directly connected your actions to your outcomes. A plus B equals C every time. You do good, you get good. You do bad, you get bad. It was simple for them. And this is much of how they read the blessings and curses that were promised to them in Deuteronomy back around the time of Moses, who the Pharisees say they were disciples of. And in many ways, it might even be despite what some of the other teachings in the Old Testament said, but this was their common understanding of life with God and everything involved in it. In their mind, if a man was born blind, it must be as a direct result of something awful that his parents did, and this was God's curse on them justifiably. Now, Jesus came into that, and he showed them pretty quickly that God doesn't work that way. 
Now, most of followers of Jesus today might mentally agree with that at first, but still in our conversations with each other and our larger conversations with the world we live in, we wonder why God keeps blessing evil people with wealth and power while letting bad things happen to good people. Now, as I've said it before, God isn't in the business of making us happy. He's in the business of making us holy. And often those situations are what helps us to grow and mature in ways that we couldn't otherwise. So if we try to interpret our world through any lens other than that, we're bound to wind up in trouble and work from some of the wrong perspectives. Now, we often get a kick out of seeing other people make mistakes. Their mistaken understandings of things Right? That's pretty fantastic. I like that one. It made me laugh. Like, maybe that cat got lost and somebody needs its owner, but I wouldn't advise it. I remember back when I was in kindergarten, I think it was in Mrs. Hagerman's class, maybe my mom. Yeah, I still remember my kindergarten teacher's name. I could probably draw you a picture of the room too, but there was one day I did not want to be in kindergarten. And so I wandered into the little playroom in the back and there was a phone and I called my parents on that phone, right? I remember having a full conversation on that phone. Now, if YouTube existed now and that was put on, I'd be in trouble, right? Because that's ridiculous. It doesn't matter if you're four. It's still silly. People would laugh at that, right? Because we say, how could you possibly misunderstand the way a phone works? It's not connected to anything. It's made by play school. It doesn't even work for little kids, let alone phoning your actual home. But situations like these, we can laugh at, right? Eh, it's a dumb mistake, whatever, it's funny. It's not a big deal, it's worth a laugh. But when it comes to how we see God and how that understanding shapes how we see everything else in our world, getting these things right isn't nearly as much of a laughing matter in the end. Getting things right is actually pretty important. So for this man and his parents, they had been given the full Job treatment by the people around them for the poor guy's entire life, being accused of wrongdoing that they never committed and blamed for their own suffering. That's a bad spot to be in. And Jesus here challenges the disciples with a new and different understanding of God's relationship with his creation and the way that God works and acts with them in mind. It's a challenging reminder to always interpret our world through God, not God by our understanding of the world around us. Because Jesus came to reveal the nature of God to us personally so that we can pursue truth with our eyes wide open. Jesus came to show the true nature of God's compassion and power that was embodied in the Messiah. It's written in verse 3 and on. That neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it's day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. And that word means sent. So Jesus, first of all, challenged the disciples' understanding of sin and sickness. That suffering isn't always the result of sin and judgment. Sometimes suffering exists for a greater purpose that we couldn't find through pleasure and ease. And then Jesus, through a little bit of wordplay, calls himself the light of the world and finally takes away the darkness that's covering this man's eyes. And maybe, maybe just to prove his point, he challenges their idea of how to see clearly by using mud to bring clarity by digging through the muck to show that there's nothing so unclean that God can't use it for his good. Jesus confronts all of their ideas of sin and sickness and then shows how little of the way of God they actually understand by making a man see clearly by putting mud in his eyes. Mud brought sight and clarity. And in the process, he says to the disciples, essentially, guys, everything you know is wrong. Now, Weird Al Yankovic has never been known as one of the greatest philosophers of our age. I will give you that. Well, sure, maybe, to some of us. 
His work is usually more satirizing other people's work, but every once in a while, every once in a while, he has something insightful and lyrically genius like this piece that stuck with me for like the last 30 years. I'm not gonna sing it for you this morning, but I could. I don't know, maybe if you give me a $5 tip in the foyer, I'll dance and sing it afterwards, we'll see. But he wrote, everything you know is wrong, up is down, black is white, and short is long, and everything you thought was so important doesn't matter anymore because the simple fact remains that everything you know is wrong, just forget the words and sing along. All you need to understand is that everything you know is wrong. The wisdom of a man with an accordion. Now, when I was in high school, it was just a silly song to sing along with, right? But as I've grown up, I've actually found it to be kind of a glowing nugget of irreducible truth in the world that we live in. Our reality is, is there's very little that we can know with certainty. But most people hold their thoughts as though they're an irreducible truth that's inarguable. So much wrong thinking and so much wrong action comes as a result of stubbornness and an unwillingness to learn not a lack of actual information out there to learn from. Real wisdom is learning to change one's mind regularly when new information comes to light, not clinging to old ideas with certainty without ever entertaining that they may actually be wrong. Now, I regularly state to my family and friends that I think I'm right, but I've been wrong before, I may be wrong now, and I will be wrong again in the future. And if we could all cling to that a little bit more tightly, we'd probably all be a little bit more close to wisdom. Because it says we learn to emotionally distance ourselves from our thoughts and ideas and accept that our identity is based on who God tells us we are, rather than just a collection of thoughts and feelings and flesh. We aren't a summation of our ideas. Then we can learn to let go of the need for certainty to find peace in this world and instead find peace in God and the pursuit of truth wherever it may be found. Because Jesus came and showed that the way the Pharisees understood God, the effects of sin and human illness were completely off base, despite the fact they claimed to be the most knowledgeable and wise teachers of God in the place. So let's let God inform our reality and not just try to shape God into ours. Jesus came to reveal the nature of God to us personally so that we can pursue truth with our eyes wide open. Reality is changed by the work and revelation of God through Jesus. It's written, the man went and washed and came home seeing, and his neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man that used to sit and beg? And some claimed that he was, and others said, no, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, no, no, I am the man. Well, how then were your eyes open, they asked. And he replied, the man that they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes, and he told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Oh, where is this man, they asked. Well, I don't know. That's all he had to say. This man gained his sight because of Jesus, and the problem was that a lot of people couldn't believe it. They couldn't reconcile it with their lived reality. Not that he could see, but if he could see, that he couldn't possibly be the same person. People's views of God and sickness and sin didn't fit what happened here, and rather than challenging their views and learning from it, they suggested that the situation just must not be what they really thought that it was. The man wasn't healed, couldn't be. It was just a different guy that looked exactly like him. Jesus came and did things that couldn't be explained by our conceptions of God and nature and showed in it that he is Lord over all things. He is the light of the world that brings clarity to all things, revealing both good and evil for what they are, where they are, even for this man who was blind from birth. Jesus is the Lord over all sickness and disease. Even the incurable could be cured through Jesus because all of nature submits to him. There's some things that change over time that we never would have expected to be possible not that long ago. 
Your ancestors never would have believed that you could read the Bible for yourself. Or some of your ancestors wouldn't believe that you could read for yourself. People of all ethnicities are equal and loved and accepted in the church. You could chat face to face with somebody on the other side of the planet today, anywhere in the world, for just about free with a phone. Ancestors never would have believed that. They wouldn't have had an idea what a phone was. What we take for granted now would have been called magic 200 years ago, maybe less. You may just well have been laughed out or attacked for suggesting the reality of something that we take for granted now. Jesus came to challenge us to get to know the real God as God actually is. And then Jesus showed what life should be like through him. Seeing God clearly for who God is will affect our outlooks on the entire rest of life. Because when we limit God, we lose the ability to actually see. It's written in verse 13 and on, that they brought the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the eyes was the Sabbath. And therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he'd received his sight. Well, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Now, some of the Pharisees said, this man isn't from God, for he doesn't keep the Sabbath. But others asked, how can a sinner perform such signs like this? And so they were divided. I guess just kind of an input here, like most other churches. And then they turned back to the blind man. What do you say about him? Well, it was your eyes he opened, the man replied. He's a prophet. So to the Pharisees, God was more concerned with us, his people, following the laws and their understandings of them to love others. In their opinion, nothing good or from God could ever come from somebody who didn't follow their understandings of the laws of God. And if Jesus had indeed miraculously healed somebody on the Sabbath when no work was permitted to be done at all, then his powers must certainly not be from God. A plus B equals C. But all of a sudden, everything they thought they understood about God and nature seemed to be in a paradox, and they didn't really know how to handle it. How often do we question the faith or power of God in someone because they don't think they follow God the right way? The Catholics must not know God because they revere Mary. Man, I grew up in that climate. The United Church must not know God because they perform same-sex marriages. We better be careful of what restrictions we put on who can actually be a friend of God. Because Jesus broke a lot of the rules himself while serving God more closely than anyone has or frankly ever will. When we're confronted with crisis, it causes us to reckon with reality. There's a psychological concept known as cognitive dissonance. Now, it can affect people in a lot of different kinds of ways, but basically stated, the human mind doesn't do so good with trying to hold two contrary ideas at the same time. So some people get really agitated and angry because they're struggling to hold it all together while defying logic in their own head. The more common reaction, though, is just rationalizing wrong beliefs as right while dismissing the truth out of hand as clearly wrong. But none of us would ever do that, right? Like ever. We're better than that. Learned religious leaders would never make mistakes like that. But it's written they still didn't believe that he had been blind and he received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son? They asked. Is this the one that you say was born blind? Because how is it that he can see now? We know that he's our son, the parents answered, and we know that he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He's of age, he'll speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. And that's why his parents said, He's of age, go ask him. 
So the Pharisees were so perplexed and confused at the paradox of a man of God healing somebody on the Sabbath that they looked for some explanation, any explanation, really, as to how this could actually fit in their understanding of the world rather than letting the world change their understanding. Rather than accepting the fact that they tried to prove this was actually a different man, or maybe that he was never actually blind to start with, because they refused to adapt, they were unable to see God in their midst. The worst of human belief and practice gets expressed in denying reality to try to maintain our reality when the obvious truth is that we understand things wrong and need to change. Jesus, in this sign, showed that he is indeed the Lord over truth. Because those who bring clarity can show it to others. It's written the second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God by telling the truth, they said. We know this man is a sinner. And he replied, well, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. But one thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. And they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered, I've told you already. You didn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to be his disciples too? It's amazing, ironic, and frightening that the religious leaders encourage the man to give glory to God by denying Jesus' power as the Messiah. That is dark. Really dark. The man, though, refused to do that and just let the truth of events speak for themselves. He'd been healed, and when he was questioned, he couldn't understand why they weren't picking this up. Why would anybody want to find fault in a man like this? Or not follow the man who could capable of this when no one else ever could? When we truly get to know and see God, we can't help but be excited by it and want to share that truth with others. Because if Jesus truly is God, come to set us free to live life to the full, how can we sit back without sharing it with others, even if we know it might make life more difficult at times? Our culture is filled with stories of those who are stuck living in an illusion, while a couple of brave prophets speak truth to them, whether it's movies like The Matrix, or shows like Westworld, or Ready Player One, or Ender's Game, we as humans are obsessed with the fact that we understand there's probably a reality that we are living in that isn't the actual reality. We're all too aware of our lack of awareness. And Jesus came to live the truth of who God is and call us to live in the truth of who we're created with the potential to be. But as it's gone for the prophets throughout thousands of years, so often it goes for others. Those who claim to see will disparage those who actually do. It's written in verse 28 that then they hurled insults at him and said, you're this fellow's disciple. We're disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, well, now that is truly remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, and yet he's the one who opened my eyes. We know God doesn't listen to sinners. He listens to the godly person who does his will. Nobody's ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind before. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. And to this they replied, clearly you're right, Jesus is Messiah. Except they didn't. They said, you're steeped in sin at birth, how dare you lecture us, and they threw him out. Interesting how the seemingly social outcast, uneducated blind man, quickly recognized God and changed his understanding of the world and God himself. But the ones who were supposed to know everything failed to see God in their midst because they knew God too well. We look at the situation a little bit and we can smirk and laugh because we say, this is ridiculous. How are they writing off Jesus in this man's testimony? But sadly, for being honest with ourselves, the modern church still does things like this. Writing off things of God as worldly or evil because they don't fit our conception of God. New ideas, new ministries, new expressions of church, 
New ideas of faith written off without legitimately doing the legwork to find out what the truth actually is. And at the same time, as we in our church change and adapt and try and learn to live in this world, we shouldn't be surprised if it causes some friction among us as people stuck in a given conception of God and Christianity discount new works of God's Spirit. If Jesus is the truth and we seek the truth above all else, we have no reason to fear what the truth might reveal to us. Trying to hide in a bubble free from outside information and influence is the fastest way to be stuck living a lie. Now, one of the most irritating and sad things that can happen in a discussion is have it to generate into an insult contest. Someone makes valid points and the other side unable to counter it just claiming that they're ignorant or they're sheep or they're deceived. We see it in kids' conversations all the time, more and more often in our politics, and constantly in our social media. When confronted with insurmountable odds, lashing out in anger often seems like the last option left. And in the end, truth wins, but it may be a rough road ahead. Jesus heard that they had thrown the man out, and when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir, the man asked. Tell me so I can believe in him. And Jesus said, you've seen him. In fact, he's the one speaking to you now. And the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I've come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. And some Pharisees were there with him, heard him this and said, what? Are we blind now too? And Jesus said, if you were blind, you wouldn't be guilty of sin. But now that you claim that you can see, your guilt remains. And it serves as a stark reminder to all of us, especially those who claim to follow Jesus, that we would never consider ourselves to completely understand God or think we finally have this Christianity thing cased. God is so much bigger than we could ever explain in an entire set of theological works or sermons, let alone within one person's finite understanding. So let's commit together to seek truth where it may be found. Trust the Spirit to actually lead and guide us along the way. To lean in to discerning well things together as a church. And humbly commit in all this to do the next right thing along the way. Jesus came to reveal the nature of God to us personally so that we can pursue truth with our eyes wide open. Let's pray together. Jesus, when you were here, you promised that when you left, you would give us the spirit to lead and guide us into truth, and conviction of sin and righteousness and judgment. And we live in a world that is filled with a lot of different opinions and truth claims. So we ask for the gift of your spirit to do that leading and guiding that you promised. Father, help us to see you well for who you actually are. Help us to see each other as you see us as loved deeply regardless of where we've come from. Help us to see those around us outside of the church with the same loving eyes that you look on us with. That we'd be willing to love and live and interact with them for who they are as people made in your image and loved by you deeply more than we could ever understand ourselves. Spirit, we pray that you would lead and guide us well and that you'd make us humble enough to follow you where you lead. That you'd help us to seek after you wholeheartedly as your people and as your church so that we can be drawn into seeing the way that you brought for this blind man. Lord, give us courage. Give us joy and excitement as we follow you down the path to where you may lead. Lord, if it's on the path that we're on, well, thanks for that, and help us to continue to have courage to do so. And if not, Lord, help us to see the better way 
so that we might follow you well and be your people well, walking with our eyes open as you have healed us and called us to do. Or we entrust ourselves to your care and your hands as your people and pray for your lead and guide. In Jesus' name, amen.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love that comforts and draws us in. When we're in times of mourning, whether we are in struggle, we thank you that you are with us. Lord, whether it's times of joy as we've sung about in your presence, we thank you for your gift of your presence with us and your promises to lead and guide us. And now to him who can do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.